have a little confession before I get started. Um, the title of this message is about priorities. Um, it has nothing to do with priorities today, okay? Just absolutely nothing. I, got, I, I use the same text, but the Spirit just led me in a very different direction. I know that's never happened to any of you, you know? You started walking from the living room to the kitchen, and by the time you got there, you forgot why you were going there. It's never happened to you all, but it happens to me, okay? It just got led in a different direction. And um, so, here we go. We're going to talk about... Well, the scholars don't know what to call them exactly. They don't know if we should call them wise men or uh, magi or something else. So I'm just going to start out by kind of referring to them as the three visitors, okay? And then you can put any name on that you want. But let's start with the ruler. The nation's leader abuses power and people. He will go to any length, any length, literally, to protect his Power, his prestige, and his position. He is often dishonest, frequently manipulative, and is very comfortable using violence to get his way. He destroys his children's lives and doesn't really seem to care. He crushes his opponents, even when they're not his opponents, and he oppresses the vulnerable, whoever they may be. He is motiva motivated primarily by a deep-seated fear or insecurity that makes irrational behavior and ridiculous statements rather commonplace. He possesses great power. He has a position in which he can accomplish much good, but he knows very little about grace or mercy or compassion. Most of us mellow a bit with age. Praise the Lord for that, right? Okay? Not this leader. He does not mellow with age at all. In fact, he is just as paranoid and vicious, maybe even more than he was when he was a younger man. Now, into this environment, there are three men who come asking about the whereabouts of a child they are convinced is going to be the next king. When they ask the old king for directions, you can imagine what happens. He starts to feel threatened and insecure and afraid because someone is going to ultimately take his position and his power away from him. So fear consumes the old king. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 3, uh, we hear that when the king heard this from the three wise men, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. It is not just about the king, because what happens with a king affects the entire nation. The, world that, the word that's translated frightened literally means to shake violently. When the three men came and started asking about a newborn king, the old king begins to physically, literally physically shake in his sandals. That's how deep the fear and the insecurity went. Sadly, the king is an old, sick man who is insecure and afraid. So as he desperately tries to hold on to this illusion of power, the people around him, the nation, become very afraid that he's going to release another campaign of terror on them. The king's reaction reminds us there are typically three responses to Jesus. There's indifference, don't care, kind of apathy, that sort of thing. There's hostility, or there's gratitude. Everyone makes a choice. Everyone makes a choice. And I think we make the choice every single day of our lives. We either don't care about Jesus, or we become hostile to Jesus, or we embrace Jesus with all of our heart. I think that's what we do. The king, in this sense, was hostile to the news about Jesus. He lies to these three visitors, these three wise men, in order to manipulate them so that he can exercise his power to destroy this new threat around him. 
initially what's interesting is that these three visitors are kind of taken in by the king because he, he seems to care. He seems to be concerned about this new king. But after meeting this newborn savior face to face, the hearts of these three wise men are changed. Now their time to be in Bethlehem has kind of come to an end. So as they're getting ready, they're packing up their belongings, I'm sure, and all of that. And the last night before they head out on their journey, they receive a word from the Lord. And it comes to them in a dream. We hear it in Matthew 2, verse 12. They went back home by another road. They are warned in a dream not to go back to Jerusalem where the king is. And you would think that kind of slowed down the king a little bit, but he's not deterred at all. He uses his position and his power to do something more awful than the people could have ever imagined. The king orders a campaign of terror. It's a little bit sad that we don't know our history better than we know it because we believe that, that terrorism is mostly a 21st century kind of phenomenon. But we are naive if that's what we believe. Campaigns of terror have been going on for most of human history and this particular king releases one on a targeted area, a little farm town by the name of Bethlehem. And he releases this campaign of terror in a very strategic and focused way. He sends his soldiers into this little town to kill every boy under the age of two years old. That's terrorism. That's terrorism. Mothers sit in shock as they rock their dead babies. Fathers try to comfort their screaming children who just watched their little brothers slaughtered right in front of them. Terrorism is never only about the ones who die. It's mostly about the ones who survive. While blood runs and tears flow and hearts break, Mary and Joseph are warned in a dream to, live, to leave Bethlehem. So they pack up and they just follow the Spirit's leading as quickly as they can. When they stop walking, Mary and Joseph find themselves living as refugees in Egypt. And just want to share a little bit of an aside with you. This is the Holy Family. They're living as refugees in a land which is not their own. Does God love them less because they are refugees? Does our Heavenly Father love His only Son, Jesus, less because He grows up as a refugee in a land that is not His own? And what does that say? about our attitude towards those who are refugees in our world today primarily because of campaigns of terror directed at them. Well, the Word of God comes oftentimes in dreams. The Lord speaks to three wise men in a dream, and they go by another road. The Lord speaks to Joseph and Mary in a dream, and they leave one place and go to another place. And I want to say the word of God to us today is that the Lord may be speaking to you in your dreams as well. You see, the word of God comes to us to clarify something or to provide us something or to protect us from something. And it comes in many different ways, but sometimes it comes in our dreams. Recently, I had a dream. In the dream, I was helping another family with the recent loss of a loved one. My dream, I was a pastor. 
That's not very exciting, but that's the way it was. And this family asked me if I would help them select the casket for their loved one. Now, the, the, the difficulty in the dream was that in the dream, my father had just died also and was laying at rest in the same funeral home where I was with this other family. As we're walking through a narrow room from, from kind of one place in the funeral home to another place where the caskets were on display, we walked through a narrow room. And in that narrow room, my father suddenly raised up, called my name, reached his hand toward me, and then said, Doug, I love you. I responded quickly, Dad, I love you too. And then he laid back down. Now, although the opportunity to tell my father I loved him was important, it was not near as important as hearing my father say, Doug, I love you. Four words. Four words spoken by my father in a dream. I believe came as a word of God to me. I believe the Lord knew I needed to have that assurance of my father's love before I could receive the fullness of God's peace in my life. I woke up from that dream with tears kind of trickling down my cheeks. I was grateful for that little conversation of those few words in my dream. But as I lay there praying and reflecting upon the dream, I was reminded that there was something else going on. I was reminded that my Heavenly Father loves me too. The Lord speaks to us in our dreams. In Acts chapter 2 verse 17, the Holy Spirit has come upon the disciples who are gathered in Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit fills the place with power and with his presence and there's all kind of things going on. And in the midst of all of that kind of confusion and chaos and manifestation of God's power, the Apostle Peter stands up and preaches a sermon. And in that sermon is this statement. It's Acts chapter 2 verse 17. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit, pour out the Holy Spirit upon all flesh, upon all people. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. That was the birth of the church. That was the coming of the Holy Spirit. But what it says is that whether we're young or old, men or women, deep in our faith or just coming to faith that there will be some visions and there will be some dreams and there will be some announcements and God will speak through those. You see, the word of God comes to us in many different ways but it always comes with a purpose. One of those ways is through our dreams. Here's something that I'm sensing. A dream will often give us a path to follow. The three wise men are given a different road to follow on the way home. Joseph and Mary are given a different place to live. The apostle Peter, I just mentioned to him, is given a path to a body of water where he can baptize 3,000 people. The apostle Paul is given a different life path, a life journey that leads him to plant several churches. If we're seeking direction from the Holy Spirit. Let us listen for the Word of God in the Bible, in our small group, in our worship, while we're serving the poor, but it's a, let's also listen for the Word of God in our dreams. Sometimes the Lord will speak to us in a dream so we know the choice to make, the direction to go, or the calling to follow. So first, a dream will often give us a path to follow. Secondly, a dream will often heal something broken. The three wise men discover a path that restores their hope and their joy and their salvation. Joseph and Mary discover a place that protects their life and their love and God's purpose for them. 
Peter discovers a path that gives birth to the Christian church, and Paul discovers a road that takes the gospel of Christ to the whole world. If we're seeking salvation or peace or love, the word of God may come to us in a dream. If we're seeking direction or clarity or assurance, the word of God may come to us in a dream. If you have a dream, and many of us do, if you have a dream in which you sense that the Lord is speaking to you, I want to invite you to respond to that in a few different ways. I'm going to hit these pretty quick. First, write down the dream. Here's the thing about dreams. They're like a morning fog in the summer. As soon as the sun gets up a little bit and that warm air hits it, that fog just dissipates really quickly. You can have a very stirring, moving, even disturbing dream. Go back to sleep, and a few hours later when you wake up, you remember maybe the emotion of sadness or joy or celebration or fear or whatever it was, but you won't remember the details of the dream. So when you have a dream, write down the dream. Write down the dream as soon as possible. Second, pray for clarity. I don't think there's anyone here, including myself, who is an expert on dream interpretation in a spiritual and theological sense. Okay? Not a single one of us. So if you have a dream in which you're sensing that the word of God is coming to you, pray for clarity. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you some more clarity about what the meaning is. Here's what I know. If the Lord speaks to you in a dream, he's not going to stop speaking to you when you wake up a few hours later. Okay? He has something on his heart he wants you to know. Third, spend some time in the Bible. This is what I know. The word of God in a dream will never contradict the word of God in the Bible. So, get into the Bible and look for confirmation of what you're sensing the Word of God is to you in your dream. Fourth, share the dream. Share your dream with a Christian friend or in your small group. What you're seeking here from other people is wise counsel. Wise counsel. Because we may have the dream really clear, but we may have what it means a little off balance. So seek the wise counsel. Share the dream with others. And fifth, write an action plan. Put into writing a plan that describes how you will trust and obey this word of God that has come to you in the dream. The word of God always invites our response. Okay. The story is about three wise men, right? Three wise men are saved their lives are preserved because the word of God came to them in a dream. The life path of Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus, the son of God, is spared, but also given direction because the word of God came to them in a dream. I want you to imagine something today. Imagine the difference that the Holy Spirit will make in your life when the Word of God comes to you in a dream or in worship or in the Scripture or in a prayer or through something a friend says. Imagine how your life will be different when the Word of God comes to you in a dream. Let us pray. Lord God, you have a word for every single one of us here today. The question is, are we willing to listen? Are we willing to get beyond our skepticism? Are we willing to get beyond our doubts and our fears or our uncomfortable feelings? Are we willing to get beyond those so that we would really listen with an open mind and an open heart and an open soul to what you have to say to us. 
Sometimes it's just our own insecurity, our own feelings of inadequacy, our own preconceived notions, our own fears, just like that old king that stand in the way of us hearing your word. A word that's filled with grace, a word that's filled with mercy, a word that's filled with love, a word that would save our souls for eternity and give our lives purpose right now. Lord God, I pray your spirit would continue to be in this place, be here in a powerful in an unavoidable and unforgettable way that you could change minds, that you could change hearts, that you could change lives, and not just for a few moments at worship, but change them for this lifetime and for eternity. But it's easy. It's just like having a dream. And waking up a few hours later, we can, we can sense your presence, we can hear your word, we can know your love. But a little while later, we can just go off and live as if it never happened. Just like with our dreams. We kind of forget about it. And get busy with something else. Holy Spirit, come upon us. Do what you did for those three wise men. Give us your word. So that you give our life purpose. Give our life direction. Give our life hope. Do what you did for Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. Speak your word into our lives. Take us where you want us to be. Grow us into who you want us to be. Give us the assurance of your protection and your provision and your presence, no matter what our environment around us looks like. Lord God, speak to every one of us here today. Give us the assurance of your love. Give us your precious peace. draw us near to your heart again. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.